My name is Terry Berghardt, and I'll be interviewing Jill Morgenthaler. This interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. The interview is taking place in Plainfield, Illinois on Saturday, April 26, 2008. Over the past century, hundreds of thousands of brave military men and women have given their lives and millions more have received physical and psychological wounds as a result of their duty to secure our way of life. Today I am honored to have as my guest one of these distinguished individuals. Our interview will be put into the permanent records of the Library of Congress. Please join me in welcoming Colonel Jill Morgenthaler. Thank you, Terry. For the, for the record, Colonel, we do have to get uh, your name, your birth date. I don't know the appropriateness of asking a woman her birth date, but <laughs> that's what I've been told. We have to get your name, birth date, and birthplace. Could you sure. do that, please? Sure. Jill Morgenthaler, uh, born in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, March 31st, 1954. Colonel, could you just give us, uh, for the introduction, a little bit brief resume or history of, of your career? Sure. First of all, I'm the daughter of a Marine. So I grew up living across the United States. My father was a Marine officer. And in 1972, as I started Penn State, the Army opened up ROTC to women to actually train with men. So this was the first integration. Until that time, women had been in the Women Army Corps, the WACs. So I decided to join. I had watched my father do some exciting military intelligence stuff at the Pentagon. And I thought, that's what I want to do, and I want to see the world. So I joined in 72 in ROTC, was commissioned in 76, served five years active duty, Korea and Germany and West Berlin, and then got off of active duty and stayed in the reserves, and I retired in 2006 as a full colonel. So you went to Penn State for ROTC. At that point, a number of your peers, I would imagine, in those years were anti-military. What made you choose such a different career path? And, and, and did you have any conflict with any of your acquaintances and friends? It was a difficult time. The Army, the military was transitioning to an all-volunteer corps. Vietnam was still going on, but uh, winding down. So a lot of young men were very concerned, trying to avoid being drafted and choosing not to join. And so it was very co contrary, one, for anyone to consider joining, let alone a young woman. And so, um, there was a lot of questions on me at Penn State. Why would I even think of doing this when men were trying to avoid duty? It, didn't not, it did not help me date much, <laughs> um, but it did give me some wonderful friends through ROTC. The other challenge is there were a lot of assumptions about women who joined. Uh, we were asked very uh, vulgar terms, you know, oh, you're a woman in the military. Are you a butch or a bimbo? And it's like, those are my choices? I don't think so. You know, and this is where it helped being the daughter of a Marine, because I would just stand proudly and say, I am an officer in the United States Army, I am a patriot. And that would just shut it down. But it was. Uh, first few years on active duty was very challenging. Mm -hmm. Men would try to avoid saluting me on bases. So I'd have to teach them how to salute again. I found humor was a wonderful weapon. So it's like, oh, let's do it again, let's do it again. But. Um, it was always exciting and there was always a sense of accomplishment and I had decided I'd stay in as long as it was fun and I stayed in right up to my 30-year mandatory retirement date. Well, you mentioned uh, using humor there. Uh, before this interview, I had a chance to go through some of your websites and, and some other kinds of background. And there was a quote, if I may, from your website that I thought really captured the, the sense of you. and. Uh, uh, after reading it, I really thought, this lady is a regular Joe. Let me read it, uh, please, for the record. Uh, it says, whoops, I need a disclaimer for my website, but my lawyer hasn't sent me one yet. So here it goes. G.I. Jill in Baghdad is not an official DOD, DA, MNFI, or any other alphabet acronym site. It is solely my point of view, my experience, my ground truth, and no one else's because there ain't no other 50-year-old Chicago female alabaster white strawberry blonde public affairs officer in Iraq. I swear to God. <laughs> I thought that was a very illustrative uh, quote from you. <laughs> Thank you. And very true. <laughs> well, you had a difficult job in, in, in Iraq. Tell us about that, please. Yeah, it was difficult. Um, it was also very rewarding. 2004, I felt we did a lot of great things there. 
We brought technology to the Iraqi people. We brought freedom of press, freedom of assembly. I watched young women no longer feel endangered because Saddam Hussein and his sons did terrible things to the young women and to others. And I actually watched them uh, choose to take off their scarves and wear Western wear and go around the streets because they felt safe. Um, it was also a very dangerous time. We had, uh, we had a lot of bombings. We had the killing of the contractors in Fallujah. We had the young private, Private Mop and Go Missing, who has just recently been found. Uh, my job was challenging because I was in charge of public relations for the whole multinational forces. So that was television, radio, newspaper, prepping the general officers, um, making sure the spokesmen who were general officers were prepared for the daily conferences. And then we had um, the Abu Ghraib prison scandal. That was a terrible thing in 2003 by seven soldiers. Uh, Department of Defense and others sat on it, and it blew up in 2004 when I was there, and I was chosen to be the spokesperson. And, um, you know, it really showed to me how seven people can underdo the great good that 120,000 young soldiers and Marines and others were doing. But I also felt uh, that I really did my job because it was finding the truth and I did a lot of my own investigations and I'm actually the one who pointed out to the American public that we we're using contractors in interroga interrogation situations I mean who knew and also that contractors over there American contractors were not covered by American law Iraqi law or military law and that's only been addressed three four years later so um, as I handled something that was disgraceful by those seven soldiers, I'm very proud of what I did to bring the truth, and I'm very proud of what all the other soldiers and Marines did while I was there. You know, there are some, though, that, uh, Colonel, that would argue uh, we were at war. People were getting killed. Americans were getting pill killed. You talked about the Fallujah incident uh, mm -hmm. of the, the people hanging from the bridge, et cetera. There was there are some that would say, particularly those with prior military background, that would say Abu Ghraib wasn't that bad given the circumstance that we were in. I mean, being at war on one side, and then we have to follow all these rules and regulations on captured prisoners. That there seemed to be uh, a real tension there about solving the issue. Mm -hmm. Well, Abu Ghraib was mostly common prisoners. These were not. Uh, terrorists in the sense of, you know, uh, masterminds in blowing up the World Trade Tower. So we really should have been following the Geneva Convention. And in fact, I think the mainstream military who ran Abu Ghraib were. It was these seven who did these terrible things at around 3 and 4 a.m. in the morning. Mm -hmm. They did it when nobody else was awake. And they all went to prison, which is the right thing. I myself have always been proud that we're part of the Geneva Convention because, you know, if I were to be taken prisoner, I would want to be treated well. I wouldn't want to be sent to some secret prison. I would want my family to know where I was. And so I, I believe very strongly in the Geneva Convention and following those because it takes care of our young Americans. I understand that. When, you know, that was a terribly difficult time. The, the, the media here was really playing it up daily. Uh, the, how did you deal with the media who came in who automatically suspected that you weren't going to be telling the truth, uh, you're going to be twisting it? How did you handle that personally? I mean, it was difficult because they would see me as the colonel, you are the spokesperson for the Pentagon. And of course, as an Army Reserve officer, um, I went there to do my job. You know, you don't choose where you go and you don't choose what you do, but I went there to do my job as best as I could, and I did. And, but it was hard because I was not uh, a lifer. I came from a public affairs in the, you know, uh, civilian community too, and so uh, sometimes it was offensive to me that people assumed that I was just walking this party line and wasn't going to get them the truth. And so I spent many hours finding the truth, and it was exhausting. I mean. Abu Ghraib took away the great good we were doing. They wiped away six weeks of my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would get up at 6 a.m., and at 9 a.m., I was responding to Iraqi and local media, 
and I could tell you the time zones by the phone calls I got. <laughs> oh, England's up now. I'd get a breather as we cross the Atlantic Ocean, and then up, oh, New York Times is up, uh, Philadelphia Inquirer is up, Baltimore Sun is up, up, oh, now Chicago Tribune is up. Get a little breather, and then I'd hit the West Coast. And so it was physically, it was very exhausting. And I just had to remind myself that I was speaking to the American media. I mean, I'm sorry. I had to remind myself I was speaking to the American people. And they deserve the truth. And that's what I had to go on. And you did a very good job at it. Oh, thank you. Tell me, uh, Colonel, what, what do you think is your biggest moment in Iraq? I guess it's the time I met and stared down Saddam Hussein. You actually saw and talked? Yes, who would ever guess? <laughs> Um, I went over there and he'd already been captured and he was being brought to a judge for his very first hearing and I pulled rank on my soldiers and I said I'm taking the media into the courtroom. Mm -hmm. So I escorted Peter Jennings, Christina Amapour, Al Jazeera, Al Iraqi into the courtroom. No room for me. So I'm outside and Saddam Hussein shows up and he's shackled and his eyes are on the ground. He's just trembling. I'm thinking to myself, he thinks he's dying today, because that's what he used to do, oh, have sure. the hearing, the sentence, and the execution. I said, this is going to get interesting. So I'm out in the hallway, and after a while you hear him yelling, and you find out later he's yelling at the judge what he's going to do to the judge and the judge's family when he's back in rifle power, and the door flies open. He comes out, he sees me, he stops, and he checks me out. He just looks me up and down like I'm this piece of meat, and I'm thinking, no way. Not to the colonel's uh -uh. Yes, yeah, so I'm just staring back at him. Yeah, you're going back in the hole. Uh -huh. And we're just staring. Neither one of us is backing off. And finally, he barks this order. The guards laugh. Take him away. And I turn to this guard. What do you say? Kill her. Uh -huh. I go, excuse me? He used to kill people for staring at him. Uh -huh. He's like, well, not this American soldier. Oh, of course, we know where he is now, and I'm glad to be here. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I called home that night, actually, and I got my uh, son, I think he was 16, I told him, and he's like, Mom, that's like being checked out by Hitler, and I'm like, oh, you are so right, I've got to go take another shower. <laughs> but yeah, who would ever guess? That's a fantastic story. I know. Story. It's like, wow. <laughs> you know, to enter the military 30-some years where they didn't want me there, and to actually face off with someone like him. Face off with someone at that yeah. point, yeah, that completely contrary to yeah. where we were going and you were going. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been a great career. Now, before um, Iraq, where, where were you in your career at that point? Yeah, that, by that time I was a full colonel. I'd been to the Army War College. Uh, before that, as a reserve officer, I was also very honored to serve in Bosnia in 1996. And, and that was a dangerous time there. We were trying to help uh, separate warring parties and also then eventually relocate. And um, I saw a lot of rebuilding in Bosnia. So I walked out of that one with a great sense of accomplishment. And then the following year, 1997, I got to help with the Kosovo refugees who were brought in from Kosovo to New Jersey. And that was exciting because the reserves did that operation first and the act of duty followed. And that was a first in its kind where the reserves came in because we were trained to do uh, relocation, setting up you know, reestablishing a settlement and things like that. I mean, we're engineers and bankers and economists, et cetera. And then the act of duty following afterwards. So the real sense of accomplishment there and got to, watch, got to personally meet some of these young people who got to end up staying in America, going to college and being able to live without fear for maybe the first time in their lives. What was it like being in, in, in the Bosnian countryside? Did you have to have any remote assignments? And I, well, I was all over the countryside because of my job in, once again, dealing with the media. And the tragedy about Bosnia, it is, it's such a beautiful country. It is Switzerland. But we would go into a village and one chalet would be fine and the next one would be smoldering and there'd only be a chimney left. And you could actually see that neighbors were picked and killed. And such hatred is hard for me to understand as an American. Mm -hmm. We don't teach hatred in our schools. We don't teach it in our churches. And so to see neighbors turn on neighbors, neighbors was horrifying. Um, 
I'm glad to say, though, we have left Bosnia. We have accomplished what we set out, which was to separate the warring parties and have them build up and be peaceful again. And I'm glad to say there are no Americans left in Bosnia, and we actually brought that to a conclusion, a peaceful conclusion. Colonel, when, when you were in Bosnia, did you have any occasion uh, to pull your weapon or use your weapon? Yes. Um, one day, flew into a village. Um, General Abazade, he was a one-star then, since then he's mm -hmm. retired as a four-star general. Um, we landed in a village where we're, uh, we had separated the Serbs from the Bosniaks, and villagers were trying to slip back into their village, and it wasn't secure enough, and so we were trying to prevent them from doing it. And so I remember uh, being in a long convoy going up this hill, and um, all of a sudden uh, there were mortars and firing, and this was the one moment I actually related to my father who had been in Vietnam because I could see people flitting through the trees. And uh, they did have like an F-15 jet or something fly over from Naples, and I'm like, where's the Apache? I don't need a jet. I need a helicopter here, you know. And um, I was out of my vehicle, and as we were walking up the mountain to try and separate the sides, we did come under fire. And um, without even thinking, I hit the ground, had my weapon out, locked and loaded, aimed. And then I realized I'd done everything right. But it was like Inst you know. instantaneously, all the training kicked in. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, uh, we did not have to fire back, but uh, it was, it really brought home how essential training is. Uh, but yeah, that was a very, uh, you don't expect that as a public affairs officer usually <laughs> to be coming under fire. But that's the kind of training that, uh, that you pick up in basic training uh, yes. uh, and things after that. Where did you take your basic training at? Our officer basic training was at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, ROTC summer camp our junior year. And that was the first time I ever had women at basic training with the men. First time. So it was 90 women and several thousand men. <laughs> And we were definitely a newsworthy story. The media was everywhere. Everything we did was being captured. Guys were getting a little resentful because there would be me running out of a stream and me doing the slide for life, you know, and they're like, why is it always you? And it's like, I'm sorry, I might be more photogenic than you guys. I'm not sure. But um, I do remember that summer, they actually had a beauty uh, contest. And I was furious because I joined the Army to serve my nation, to be a patriot, not to be a beauty contestant, and I was ordered in the beauty contest. Oh my God. So um, I do remember at one point uh, I went up on stage and kind of did a gesture and ran away. <laughs> What, what kind of gesture <laughs> did you do, Colonel? Well, let's just say I, I let everybody know what I thought of a beauty contest. <laughs> <laughs> and I ran away. And they never had the beauty contest after that. After that? Yes, because I was, you know, I walked out on stage and there's several thousand men scream, screaming at us, trying to grab our legs. I mean, it just reminded me of like one of those ugly scenes you see, you know, when you watch, oh, what's the movie uh, about? Apocalypse Now. Exactly. That's what it reminded me of. I mean, in some ways it was kind of scary. So I, I did a gesture I don't ever do, <laughs> and then I ran away. And, uh, yeah, they never had a beauty contest after that. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> yeah, as, as, as you should be. Yeah. So you, you were in the military. You saw the, the very beginning of using women. Yes. And now to the point where... No one thinks twice about nobody it. Nobody thinks twice about it. Yeah. And that you're automatically trained to hit the ground, lock and load, and move on. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, one of my assignments as a reserve officer is I took my command over to Egypt for Bright Star. This was after Bosnia. And um, I was assigned, our unit was actually assigned to respond to an Egyptian two-star general. And when the general met me, he said, um, Lieutenant Colonel Morgenthaler, I'm not dealing with you, you are a woman. And I thought, well, I'm not here in Egypt to overturn several centuries of custom. So I said, okay, sir, you can deal with Major Healy. Well, after we left the general's office, I turned to Major Healy and I said, Major Healy, every decision will come through me. And I'm not a micromanager, but I also know that that is where the power and control and command and control is. 
So what happened is the general was on the fifth floor of the building. We were on the bottom floor. There were no elevators out at this military camp. Mm -hmm. So every time the general wanted something, he had to send a private down five floors who got Major Healy, who had to go up five floors, who would get the general's officer's request and go, I have to kill, clear it with Colonel Morgenthaler. Major Healy would come down five floors, get my permission, and then have to go back up five floors to tell the general we would do it. I don't care what your nationality is, as a general officer, you don't want to be kept waiting. Mm -hmm. So one day the private came down and said, Colonel Morgenthaler, please. Oh. And as I went up those five floors, I thought, oh, I taught an old dog a new trick. <laughs> and after that, he worked with me. So it did play out well. <laughs> yes, <it did. laughs> we are, you know, in several places in the country, and, and, and you've had some experience switching back again uh, to the Iraq area. You've had some personal experience with uh, some of the people that had been invaded by Saddam in the uh, in the what, in the 90s, I guess it was, mm -hmm. in Kuwait. Yes. Tell me about that that kind of an experience. Well, I actually have in-laws who are Kuwaitis. Oh. And so um, I went to stay with them for four days while I was in Iraq, and. Uh, they were so gracious, took me all around Kuwait, explained uh, the dependency on oil, their whole economy is based on oil. And they pointed out to me how Iraq is probably one of the wealthiest nations in that part of the world, that with a benign leader, it, uh, Iraq would be naturally great because they have water and oil and agriculture and biblical sites. I actually got down to um, Babylon. Um, but in Kuwait, there was still residual um, hatred of the Iraqis because of the invasion in the 1990s and the horrendous things that were done to the Kuwaitis people and time had, had not healed those wounds yet. Did any of those people that you visited have any direct experience with the invasion? Yes, um, my sister-in-law remembered um, they had to make sure they had a picture of Saddam Hussein, an Iraqi, hanging in their living room and then when the um, Iraqi soldiers came in she had she and uh, her staff the women had to flee and hide for fear of being raped or murdered so as the soldiers came in one day one door they were fleeing out another door and fortunately were not hurt mm, my goodness when you left the military what did you do at that point well, uh, after I returned um, from Iraq about a year later, I was asked to run Homeland Security for the state of Illinois because of my military experience, but I also had emergency management experience working at Argonne National Laboratory. So, so for the last two years, I, was, I have been in charge of Homeland Security in Illinois and working with wonderful first responders. And recently, I resigned that position. I'm now running for U.S. Congress. And in what district is that? That's in the 6th District in Illinois. Okay, and that's up by Des Plaines, Mount Prospect? Right, exactly, near O'Hare. Well, good luck on that. Oh, thank you. Your military experience and, and your leadership training, I, I think, uh, provided you the experience then to move into the, the, the position you have now with the state in terms of emergency services. How did you apply that when, when you first started in, in Illinois? Well, fortunately, you know, Homeland Security and first responders are actually based on a similar military model. You have unified command, you know, you have one commander, you have logistics, you have supply, you have information gathering or intelligence, you have response. So uh, walking into Homeland Security was a natural fit, especially working with police officers, firefighters, because they too are coming from the same kind of command and control. And the other thing in Illinois, we're just blessed to have uh, about 80,000 first responders across the state, highly trained, highly committed. And it was very exciting. Uh, one thing I'm, I'm proud of is we had a blizzard hit Illinois, same time it hit Pennsylvania. The response to the blizzard in Pennsylvania made really bad news. Our response didn't make any news, and I think it's because we did it right. Mm -hmm. uh, we had told people, stay off the highways. So about 200 of them got stuck at a rest stop. Ice storms came in, state police couldn't reach them. They were going off the road too. And everyone has a cell phone, so they start to call up. Uh, the vending machines are empty. Uh -huh. I need diapers. We're low on medicine. So we're getting all these calls. And so we, we activated our command post, and what we did is we had the American Red Cross, a private or organization, make 200 meals and gather the uh, diapers and everything else. And then we had the uh, National Guard actually took those and drove them out to a, pa uh, a pad 
and then the National Guard helicopters flew them further in and then Illinois Natural Resources had 23 snowmobiles mm -hmm. and they took the 100, 200 lunch meals then directly to the people through the snowmobiles and it just worked like this. I mean we were high-fiving each other mm -hmm. and we never got any bad publicity because we took care of the citizens and so I it was wonderful being able to having taken my 30 years being able to apply that directly to for the citizens in Illinois. Thank you. Well, tell us anything else you'd like to add to, to the record. Um, you know, it, right now it's a painful time for parents to think of their children going into the military because we do have a war that we have not set objectives to and we have not determined what we need to do to end it. And that's something that, one reason why I'm running for Congress, we really need a, an end and a strategy. But I would truly encourage young people to consider the military because you get to do so much good around the world. You get to have a far greater sense of what America is and what wonderful freedoms we have that we just take for granted that are fragile. We have to protect them. And so I wouldn't be the person I am today if it wasn't for having entered the military. So I really would encourage young people to still consider it. It's still a fantastic career. And as I said, I stayed in as long as it was fun. And I stayed in 30 years. 30 years is a long time, and uh, we've talked about some of the high points. Were there any real low points for you when you were in the service? Yeah, my first assignment was in Korea back in 1976. There was only three women on the whole military base, <laughs> and my job was actually to inspect every Army site. So I went out in places where they'd never seen a Western woman, that actually a shy 22-year-old, so I go into villages where the whole village would come out to stare and point at me. Mm -hmm. And that was hard, and I didn't have other women to, to share problems with. Sure. You know, uh, there are so few of us. Uh, since then, now I, uh, of course, my husband, after I married him, he'd be like the only husband. Now it's wonderful because there's women of all ranks. There's women with children. There's husbands who support them. And so there's a network. But for the first few years of my military career, it was very lonely. Sure, I can imagine that. And after Korea, where, where did you go? I went from Korea over to Germany. I worked in Munich. I did military intelligence during my five years of active duty. Now, what does military intelligence mean? You mean the oxymoron? <laughs> Some people, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't want to go there. Um, it was actually very exciting because if you remember, the 70s was still part of the Cold War. Sure. And we still had the Soviet Union. And so when I was in Korea, actually my part was more of the defense, protecting our sites from having our ciphers and codes stolen or being eavesdropped on by communist China or communist North Korea. Uh, in Germany, in, uh, I was in Munich and then ended up in West Berlin. And West Berlin, if you remember, was surrounded mm -hmm. by East Germany and then you had Poland, you had the Soviet Union. And it was very exciting because um, Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan the time I was in West Berlin. And we thought we were going to go to war. And here we were, this little military enclave, totally surrounded sure. by communism. And how were we going to respond? And I remember uh, the two-star general calling me up as a captain of my little unit. And he said, Captain Morgenthaler, what's your listening unit going to do? And I was like, well, sir, my men will be infantry and my women will run radio communications and I'll be with you at the command post. And he's like, okay. Like, well, <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> Uh, but it was very tenseful. In fact, watching Charlie Wilson's war mm -hmm. reminded me that followed after what mm -hmm. we had experienced in, um, in Berlin. Mm -hmm. But it was an exciting time, you know, watching the Russians watch us. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have not been back to Berlin since the wall fell, and I really need to go back there and see it as a unified city because there was so much paranoia when I was there. I'm sure. I'm sure. And after Berlin? After Berlin, I decided to get off of active duty, and I went to the West Coast, went to graduate school, and decided... What did you get your degree in? I got my master's in international policy oh, studies, awful. and I studied Chinese, and ended up working in uh, San Francisco for the Department of Commerce, helping businesses export, and that's also the time I met my husband, and uh, helped with the uh, recovery from the San Francisco earthquake. That happened a few weeks after my son was born. I remember seeing that on TV. I mean, I, I was watching a sporting event of some kind. Yes, the World camera. Series. That's what it was, okay. <laughs> yes, and I was at home on maternity leave. I was actually watching my son, and all of a sudden the earth waved in front uh -huh. of me. And so I just sat down, 
and a, a young woman came running out with her three children, terrified, saw me, and she got this look of relief, sat down mm -hmm. next with me, and we just kind of rode it. And then there were, you know, we didn't have cell phones. Mm -hmm. I had no idea to, if I knew if my husband was alive, because they said these bridges were down, hundreds of people were dead, oh, you know, everything was exaggerated, and I just remember walking around for hours with the baby, you know, what am I gonna do? And finally my neighbor sat me down, gave me a beer, and he showed up. And then I ended up helping uh, go in there and help families move their furniture in the homes that had to be destroyed because they're mm -hmm. no longer safe, which was rather heartbreaking, but also, once again, a sense of accomplishment and helping people. So then you had left active duty. What urged you or caused you to come back? I loved staying in the reserves. It was mm -hmm. perfect for me. I was able to have my family in one place. My kids go to the same schools and know the same kids where I, as a Marine Corps brat, did not. Um, it gave stability in my career, my husband's career, and yet it still let me go to places like Hawaii and Thailand and Egypt and Germany and Bosnia and Iraq. So um, it was a perfect solution for me. I could do some military and then come home and stay where I was. Mm -hmm. And it was exciting. You know, international news could, in fact, could affect my life. Where were you at in Thailand? Thailand, I was in Karat. I was oh, I uh, there for uh, Cobra Gold. Mm -hmm. In fact, I went there and there were supposed to be no women there. <laughs> so they were furious that I was there. Who's they? Uh, special Forces. Oh, okay. American Special Forces. The ties were fine. Uh, so I just hung in there and did my job. They kept trying to tell me not to. And I kept remembering, okay, uh, you know, a, a lieutenant colonel sent me here. And then finally, the best thing that could ever have happened, uh, four-star general came in, special forces, we're all standing at attention. He mm -hmm. goes, I want to talk to Captain Morgenthaler. And I'm like, why? <laughs> and he goes, do you know Colonel Wendell Morgenthaler? Yes, sir, that's my father. Oh, I just had dinner with him last week. <laughs> and next thing, the next day, I was briefing the general wise there, and people were letting me do my job. Uh -huh. And I called my father, and I said, that is the only man I ever needed you to know for me. <laughs> so, and then the following year, I went back, and lots of women showed up, too, uh -huh. and we did our job. That was a period of change. Yes, really a was. big period of change. And the military has changed dramatically. Oh, yeah, it's really? wonderful. Yeah. I mean... I sometimes hear from women scientists, women ministers, the challenges they face, and I think, well, we got through that in the 70s and 80s in the military. That's mm -hmm. over with. And it's still going on in some parts of society. Yeah, uh, but change, change will come. Yes, it will. And women work hard, and they do well, and they prove themselves. Yes, and I really love uh, your quote about uh, the female alabaster white strawberry blonde public affairs officer. <laughs> <laughs> that is me. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that really speaks towards how you see yourself. Uh, that uh, you understand in, in, in your job that it was to, to get the truth out. And in order to do that effectively, you have to be a regular person. And if, even for being a colonel coming from an old corporal, you are a regular person. I'm good. Well, and you know, I think you know, sometimes when you look back at the hardships, it just prepares you so when you have to hang in there and just do your job, no matter what, you do it. Because I know behind me are all the other women who want to succeed. I can't let them down. So I just hang in there and do it. Well, is there anything else that you would like to add to this? Mm -hmm. Well, God bless America and God bless all our veterans and young people serving today. Yes, the country is very, very fortunate. Uh, we've got an all-volunteer force. Yes. And uh, I have to admit that uh, when that started, I was a bit skeptical. Um, but it strikes me is that we are recruiting and training those kinds of people who do the job for us. And that in the end, it, it, it gets down to brain power and some degree of intelligence yes. of our service people. And I'm not sure that the general public always ascribes uh, to the military that level of intelligence. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's nice to know when you're out there that the person next to you wants to be there too. That's correct. It makes it a lot easier. Okay. Earlier you said that uh, you had attended the War College uh, mm -hmm. in your career. Where, where exactly is the War College and, and what degrees do they offer? Yeah. The Army War College is in Carlisle, Pennsylvania and it's funny. As I was studying uh, um, at the War College, we did uh, papers and assignments for eight months at home, and then we'd go out to the War College for two weeks. I remember 
my son asked me one day, Mom, did you go to the Army High School? <laughs> and it's like, what a natural question, Army War College, yeah. Uh, it is uh, a program to take officers to the next strategic level. And we actually, I actually received a master's in uh, strategic studies. And, and so it, it takes you uh, much higher than your own experience where you learn to work with nations and the federal government at the higher level that prepares people to be general officers or to work at a higher level in the government. A fascinating program. I'm, my whole life was enriched by going there. And where is Carlisle, Pennsylvania? Carlisle, Pennsylvania is near Harrisburg. Oh, it's okay. out in Pennsylvania, Dutch sure. country. Amish country too, right? Yes. Yes, it yeah. is. Yeah. Okay. Well, Colonel, you've seen a, a number of changes uh, in the military, particularly with women. Can you tell us a little bit what, what you think are the firsts that you saw or, or went through? Yeah. Um, well, as a young officer, and I actually stationed in Korea, my brand, I was the first woman uh, in that unit. I was an operations officer and ended up commanding for a short time along the DMZ. So I was the first woman um, company level commander. And then I continued doing that when I went on to Germany. After I got, went, uh, got out of the active duty, went into the reserves, I ended up being the first battalion, woman battalion commander here in Illinois at the 318th Press Camp headquarters. Uh, and then later on in my career as a full colonel, actually lieutenant colonel to full colonel, I became the first woman brigade commander out of the 84th Division. I commanded several hundred soldiers across six states and we ran all the professional schools. So um, there were a lot of firsts in my career. A lot of good, big, major firsts. Yes, yeah, it was fun. And Colonel, after Korea, uh, where did your career take you? Well, I did active duty in Korea, and from there I ended up doing active duty in Germany, in, in Munich and Berlin. When I got off of active duty, I, I moved out to, San Fr uh, to Monterey in San Francisco, ended up being a reserve officer for a while with my wartime assignment being Hawaii, because somebody has to do it. <laughs> so it was great for a few years. And then I ended up um, being an officer, civil affairs officer at Presidio, San Francisco. And that, of course, civil affairs is rebuilding nations. So I transitioned from military intelligence to civil affairs. Uh, my husband took a job here in Illinois, so I moved with him and my, our son and ended up doing civil affairs at, uh, in Homewood, Illinois. And then I ended up getting a battalion command in, in the press camp. And, and then from there, uh, it was while I was commanding the press camp that I actually went to Bosnia and served and then came back and also served in Egypt. And after that, ended up working for the 8th Army, which is out of Indianapolis but supports Korea. And after that, worked for the 84th Division where I commanded a school brigade. So uh, it was a, a lot of assignments with natural progression and, na and adding the education because that's one thing the military is always uh, providing education and if you're going to move forward you have to keep taking education. You said you were in Homewood, Illinois. Yes. What were you doing in Homewood? Uh, Homewood is the, is the 308th Civil Affairs Brigade is stationed okay. out of Homewood. So that's where I was. I was actually um, an economic officer. And during the first Gulf War I was supposed to go with the second wave and actually run a POW camp. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, wow, you're sending me, an American woman, into a Muslim society to run a POW camp? Have we thought this through? <laughs> and I figured, well, I'll just get some big bodyguards. Well, we never had a second wave, mm -hmm. so I did not end up going to that war. Um, so the first one I went to was Bosnia then in 1996, and then, of course, Iraq uh, in, 19, in 2004. Colonel, I want to thank you for taking the time uh, to be with us today and, and, and to share your experiences and your leadership. Oh, thank you. Uh, I think you broke uh, a lot of new ground, and I understand you've got some additional ground to break uh, in terms of running for office, and we wish you uh, the best on that. Uh, it's very, very important that we have a record of the achievements and the personalities uh, of people that have served our country. Um, the public generally d doesn't understand the kinds of sacrifices and moving families uh, that a lot of people have. And uh, I want to thank you for contributing to the program for the Library of Congress. Well, this has been an excellent interview. You've got oh, good. a number of wonderful... I know. Things. I have to write a book one of these days. <laughs>
Well, you know, you ha you had to challenge uh, the system, recognizing yeah. the value and the worth of, of women. I think you've done an excellent example. Thank you. And the, you know, the page has turned on on some of those early chapters. Yes, I'm sure we've got pages to go, but uh, but yeah, our daughters face uh, a far better world. They don't. The good news is, uh, they're just accepted. I mean. Well, I guess one of the good moments for me was one day one of my soldiers was getting married mm -hmm. and he said to his mother, well, I want to invite Colonel Morgan Thaler and her husband. I don't necessarily want the kids to come. How do I do that? Mm -hmm. And his mother said, your commander's a woman? Why didn't you tell me that? <laughs> and he's like, uh, so what? Uh -huh, yeah. And that was really cool. Uh -huh. So what? Sure. Yeah, I thought that showed how far we'd come.